Hey, what's going on everyone with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department? I'm Chris Martin, and today you're watching Expo Live. Expo Live is a series of 13 live events that we're hosting as part of Wyoming Outdoor Expo. Uh, so if this is the first event that you're tuning into, don't worry. Uh, it's just the second event in the series, so there's still a lot more to come. And you can always go back and watch past uh, live events on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. So with that, uh, let's get started. And to everyone who's tuning in, just introduce yourself, let us know where you're from, and we'll dive right in. Today we'll be showing you two uses for sous vide machines. What is sous vide? It's a low temp slow cook method of cooking where the food is cooked under a vacuum. Sous vide is French for under vacuum and uh, make no mistake, it's a great way to cook uh, game meat. But also um, there are, there's another use that we're gonna show you at the end of this broadcast and that involves cleaning your big game skulls for um, a DIY European mount. It's a great way uh, that kind of eliminates some of the mess and the smell of other methods. Um, so let's dive right in. First, we're gonna kick it off with the recipe. We have Catherine Boswell here, and she is going to uh, take you to her kitchen and show you what it takes to make a great sous vide elk roast. So let's uh, take a look. Hello, and welcome to my kitchen. I'm a relatively new hunter, and I learned about sous vide cooking as a way to prepare my medicine in a tender and delicious way. Sous vide is French for under vacuum, and it involves the use of a circulator keeping water at a very precise temperature. Sous vide cooking has been used for, in restaurants for years, uh, and now new technology allows us to sous vide at home. You start with a pot. Uh, I use my pasta pot. It just needs to be big enough to uh, cover the roast. We'll fill it with water, enough to cover the roast and allow for some evaporation. The next thing to think about is time and temperature. Temperature is for doneness, time is for tenderness. We'll set this at 130 degrees for a medium rare venison roast. It's a little bit lower than I would for beef, but that's because venison is so lean and cooks differently than domestic beef. For time, we'll cook this for 24 hours. Now it'll be done within about four hours based on its uh, thickness. It'll be edge to edge, 130 degrees, by then, but the longer we cook it, the more the connective tissue has a chance to break down. So we'll cook it for 24 hours and we'll have a tender, medium rare venison roast. This is a circulator. There's several available uh, from about $125 to $250. Uh, mine works through Wi-Fi. So I can just set the temperature on my phone and I'm setting it for 130 degrees and then I'll start it. Now, um, I don't have to stay here. This is just good to go. So now that it's warming up, I'll start to work on preparing my roast. While the water's warming up, I will prep my venison for a rub by removing all of the silver skin that I can. Now, I always use the term venison, but this is elk and venison is a term that I use for all wild game. So antelope, moose, deer, elk, it's all venison, and it's all perfect for sous vide. If you think about wild game, they're all lean, mean, climbing, migrating machines. That leanness is one of the benefits of eating wild game, but it's also one of the challenges of cooking wild game, which makes it all just perfect for sous vide cooking. The long 24-hour cook will break down that connective tissue and will end up with something very tender uh, and also medium rare. Now it's ready for the rub. A rub is a garlicky herb rub. We'll start with two teaspoons of thyme and then one teaspoon each of garlic, marjoram, rosemary, and black pepper. We finished it off with a splash of olive oil, just enough to bind it together. So our rub is done and now we can get to rubbing. Uh, you'll notice that there is no salt in this rub, and also uh, we use dried garlic instead of fresh. Salt with these long cooks can make the uh, meat more tough, and uh, with garlic, it's always a good idea to use dried rather than fresh. The 
temperature is too low and uh, so it's just raw garlic it's not really cooking um, the garlic so this is going to be a great flavor for our roast but then also we'll be using the juices from the cook to make um, an au jus our water's ready we've made our rub and fully prepared our roast and now it's time to cook i use bpa free freezer bags some folks use vacuum sealers. Uh, it's all what you have. So we'll put it in the bag and then we'll just submerse it and let the heat, the weight of the, of the roast drive out the water. We'll then seal it and anchor it to the side with binder clips. Now if it, was, if it was floating, I would add another binder clip to the bottom and put a knife through it and that would help weight down the roast. Since this is a long roast, I'm going to cover it with plastic wrap to prevent evaporation. Uh, some folks use ping pong balls uh, to break that up, but uh, plastic wrap works really well. I'll do uh, three passes on this uh, and it will be good to go for 24 hours. And this third piece, we're good to go. And in 24 hours, we will have a perfect 130 degree medium rare venison roast. And we'll finish it off in a ripping hot frying pan. Our roast has been cooking or circulating for about 24 hours. So it's time to start the next phase. First, we'll remove the roast and let it rest in the bag juices for about 30 minutes. Now we'll add the bag juices to a saucepan along with about the same amount of wine. You can use red or white. We'll let that boil and reduce while I sear the roast. Next, we'll dry off the roast so we can get a good sear. That looks pretty good. Now, we'll get our pan going. We wanna get it ripping hot and we'll start with oil to fill the pores of the pan. We'll add butter for the flavor. Now that our pan is ripping hot, we'll add our roast and start to caramelize uh, and get a nice good crust. You can caramelize to your personal preference. The important thing is to get your skillet quite hot. Our roast is finished. We have that perfect 130 degrees edge to edge, medium rare roast. Our pan sauce is finished and it's delicious. For many hunters, the meat we harvest is precious and we feel an extra responsibility to take good care of it and not mess it up. If you're concerned about sous vide, my number one piece of advice, which was what I was told when I started, was to just go for it. Find a good recipe for beef, Substitute dry herbs and aromatics for fresh and leave out the salt. Lower the temp a few degrees and just go for it. Thanks for joining me in my kitchen. All right, so uh, thanks Catherine for uh, walking us through that recipe. Um, I guess to start off with, I'll uh, kick it off with a couple questions for Catherine, but uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions of your own, feel free to drop them in the comments and uh, I'll pass them along to Catherine here in a moment. But uh, to start off with Catherine, uh, when I think of a meal that takes uh, hours and hours to prepare, I think of a lot of work, a lot of chopping. Um, is that a, your experience with sous vide or how does it differ? Oh, and uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, it's absolutely the opposite. Um, I've found with sous vide cooking, I can, uh, the circulator does all the work. And so I am, uh, I can, I just put it in there and go. Now with other other recipes for perhaps chicken, um, I will start it uh, swimming or circulating and then I'll make the rest of my dinner and then come back to it and it is good. So, uh, so it is really a uh, efficient use in my time. Yeah, definitely. Um... 
I was actually there when we were uh, making it and I was surprised because I wouldn't consider myself a great chef by any stretch of the imagination. And it was very easy to get going and yeah, you just let it sit and you are golden. So um, talk about your learning curve and your journey with sous vide cooking. Um, when did you start and how did you get into it? Mm. Um. I am a relatively new hunter. I started hunting uh, in about uh, 2015 and was nervous about uh, screwing it up. I heard you know, things about wild game cooking, uh, that it was hard and you had to do it just right. And so I started researching. And when I found sous vide uh, as an option. Um, and so I got it for Christmas. And honestly, I have not had any major screw ups um, with my with proteins. Now I have a hard time hard boiling an egg because a lot of people do those and do it well, but I um, I haven't figured that out yet. But um, with uh, proteins, I have not had everything's been great uh, and it's really pretty amazing. Nice. And um, we do have one question from Buck. He's asking, uh, does the old method of soaking in milk actually remove uh, the gamey taste of speed goat? And uh, I think that is something that is commonly thought of when talking about antelope um, or pronghorn. People uh, tend to think of them as being very gamey tasting. But I'm curious, have you cooked antelope with sous vide? And uh, how do you get rid of that? gamey taste you know chris and buck i found that um the taste of the, of the uh, venison really depends on how you uh care for it after it's harvested and uh the actual um i have had uh, very good luck with with my uh venison and actually venison, uh, for pronghorn elk uh that deer, all of those uh, species. If you can get those uh, animals cooled off, that meat cooled off quickly, get the skin off of it um, as quick as possible, uh, that really does seem to help with um, with the taste. Uh, and then also make sure that uh, when you do take that shot, that it hasn't done a lot of running and energy because that can also uh, contribute to the taste of the meat. Um, as far as cooking the milk, um, I haven't tried it, but I've, I've heard that it does work. Um, so, go for it. Yeah, and I think uh, that's a nice transition to the fact that sous vide is uh, kind of a tool of the kitchen. So um, it's definitely not the only way to prepare your game meat. There's lots of great uh, recipes out there. Um, but I'm wondering, Catherine, are there any cuts of meat that you wouldn't recommend cooking with sous vide? Well, you know, I think it's all personal preference, and sous vide will work great for every every cut. Uh, but you know, I like to grill my tenderloin and my backstrap, um, and so I will not. I've never sous vide used sous vide for that. Um, I also like to make jerky out of certain cuts, but um, in general, uh, I think the best cuts for sous vide are the ones that are traditionally thought of as more tough. So maybe some of your uh, hind, hind roasts or maybe a shoulder roast. Uh, those are definitely really uh, good for that. Uh, but uh, I think any seaweed is great. And, you know, if you're a new hunter and you don't know what that thing is that's coming out of your freezer and you've got a piece of mystery meat, so, uh, seaweed will be great for that. All right. Looks like Chris might be frozen. I'm going to go to some questions that I see coming along. Um, I see that Melissa in Lander has asked if the roast needs to rest for a while before caramelization, or do you want to caramelize it as soon as possible once it's done? Um, and uh, I would, my recommendation is to let it rest for a while. Um, I usually let mine rest for about 30 minutes. Uh, and then and the reason I do that is so that because I'm going to apply a lot of heat uh, right afterwards, uh, you know, in the next step, and I don't want to raise the temperature, uh, so I will keep that going. Uh, I would let that rest and let the temperature come down a little bit, so that when I uh, go to uh, sear it for that final caramelization step, uh, that it doesn't raise the temperature and 
that we stay at medium rare. Um, you're back. I am sorry about that. Um, I don't know. My connection got a little unstable, but um, yeah, I guess I don't know if you've moved into some of the other comments, but um, we'll just pick it up there. Uh, Melissa asks, does the roast need to rest a while before caramelization, or do you want to caramelize as soon as possible once it's done? And Chris, that's the one we talked about while you were done. Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, um, I guess, would that work well for a neck roast? Uh, I will say that I have not done a neck roast, but I do know of people that do sous vide with the bone in. Um, and so uh, I think that would have to work well. Um, especially with pronghorn, um, when uh, you don't have any of other concerns. All right. And then, um, so thinking of trying new things and venturing out into uh, cuts of meat or recipes you haven't tried before, uh, where do you go for inspiration? So my uh, favorite wild bean cook is Danielle Pruitt, and she uh, is with wildandwhole.com. Uh, but um, what I have also done is I just look for beef recipes and then adapt. Uh, so that, that recipe that we uh, used in, in the video I have done the exact same recipe with fresh for a beef tenderloin on the grill, um, and it's great. So if you have recipes that you like uh, for beef, try them with some beef. Um, that would be my uh, number one uh, piece of advice. Um, and uh, the antelope or venison and pronghorn, sorry, um, uh, they uh, cooks differently because it's so lean and um, so lower your temp just before you sleep. But don't ever do long cook longer uh, at a lower temp than 130 degrees. All right. Um, well, looking through the comments, it looks like most of the questions um, are have been answered. So we're going to change gears here and move into the next segment of this Expo Live, which is how to use a sous vide circulator to clean your big game skulls. Now, I think it goes without saying, although maybe not, you probably don't want to use the same sous vide circulator to cook your, uh, <laughs> your roast as the one that you use to clean your big game skulls. So uh, keep that in mind. But uh, the one thing that's really great about using sous vide to clean that big game skull is some of the other methods can be a little stinky. And it's certainly not the, uh, the worst thing in the world, but uh, obviously, the more pleasant you can make it, uh, the better. So we're going to share a quick video uh, where Nick talks about how to use a sous vide circulator to get that nice clean skull that you can use for a nice do-it-yourself European mount. So um, let me just pull it up here real quick, and we will dive right in. Today I'm going to show you a way to use a simple kitchen appliance to turn your big game head into a cleaned up uh, European mount that can be displayed in your home. Some advantages to this technique are that it's uh, obviously it's inexpensive, it's something anybody can do in their home or their garage. Uh, also it has substantially less smell than a lot of other techniques in general. A really simple and convenient way to do this uh, even if you don't have a lot of space to um, do some of the other methods that don't smell as good. So um, this is a sous vide machine um, that's a really common kitchen appliance that you can find at pretty much any store where kitchen supplies are sold. It'll do lots and lots of skull cleanings for you. In addition to the sous vide machine, you're going to need some powdered laundry detergent and also some Bondo for reattaching the horns. You probably already know that antelope horns are actually an outer sheath with an inner core. And what's worth knowing is there's actually a lot of tissue on the inside of this horn that we're going to have to clean out as part of this skull cleaning process. So the first step is going to be to get our skull into the sous vide bath and uh, heat up the horns so that we can remove them and clean out that tissue. Okay, so I've filled the pot with enough hot water to cover at least half of the horns, and I've turned the sous vide machine on to 155 degrees. Now I will put the head in, and it'll cook for three to four hours before the horns will pop off. Okay, 
So at this point, the head has been cooking in the sous vide pot for four hours. We're gonna remove it from the water, drain out as much water as we can, and then uh, we're gonna remove the two horns. So the secret for removing these horns, you don't actually want to pull straight up. The secret is to grab each one and twist either direction, and uh, they should loosen up and pop off. So these, these horns will be washed up uh, with a garden hose and they're basically just going to dry out and wait for the rest of the head to be cleaned before we reattach them. Okay, the next step, we've replaced the water in this container and now we're going to um, stir in two to three scoops of powdered detergent and try to dissolve it as much as we can. This is going to help break down the flesh on the skull and also help pull grease um, out of the bone to make it a little bit more white. Now we're gonna put the skull back into the pot and restart the sous vide machine. This time the machine will be set for 145 degrees. Cook it for approximately the next 36 hours and you can clean the skull with a garden hose every 12 or so hours and change the water and um, powder detergent mixture and as you continue to clean it and, and replace the water, you'll continuously get more and more flesh off of it. So at this point, the skull has been in the sous vide for a total of 24 hours. And over the course of that time, I took it out twice and sprayed it with a garden hose. And one time, halfway through, I changed the water and detergent mixture. And you can see that uh, that in this case 24 hours was enough. We've knocked out all the, the flesh and tissue and even including inside the skull where the brain was is, is now all clean and um, the tissue is gone. So uh, we're ready to let this dry and then move on to reattaching the horns. And also um, we've lost a tooth here in the front and I'll show you how to um, put that back in as well. Okay, so we're ready to mix up our two part epoxy for reattaching the horns. I'm gonna take about. Uh, I'm gonna take some bondo out of this can that's about the size of a shooter marble or so for each horn individually, and mix it up individually. Um, just like this. And then I'm going to scrape this and try to put it as far up into the top of the horn as I can as I can reach. Um, that's just going to make try to keep it as uh, hidden as possible um, when it's attached to the skull. It'll keep it from from oozing out to the bottom of the horn. Once in a while, a couple teeth will fall out, and that's just a simple um, reattachment. You can put some more of your adhesive on the tooth and uh, reinsert it back where it belongs. So this technique, as you can see, is uh, really efficient for cleaning antelope skulls. It'll obviously also work for um, elk and deer skulls. Um, the thing to, to note and to be mindful of is there are uh, regulations regarding how to dispose of tissue for animals that can carry chronic wasting disease. So please just be familiar with those regulations and um, dispose of that tissue appropriately. All right. Well, um, so yeah, it looks like we have a few comments coming in from all of you. Uh, Amanda says, uh, 
for me, it seems to take longer than my method, but way less messy. And um, it's true that it does take uh, quite a long time. I mean, 36 hours is no joke. Um, however, it does do a very great job at getting all of that material off the skull. And um, it is not very messy. And like I said, the smell um, is a big difference too. So if you haven't given it a try and you're interested, I would highly recommend it. Uh, Ryan says, I used a sous vide machine on my elk this year and it worked great. So uh, thanks uh, for providing that, Ryan. And um, it looks like that's most of it. Um, we have a question from Melissa. She asks uh, on Facebook, does the detergent bath cut the smell on the skull? And I don't know that the detergent makes a big difference. Um, it still has a little bit of smell to it, but it's definitely um, not too bad. And I'm sure uh, the detergent does make a teeny bit of di difference, but it doesn't hide the smell completely. Um, and Ryan uh, confirms that as well. He says, the smell isn't bad at all. Close the bathroom door and no smell came through. So <laughs> it's quite the feat, but um, like I said, uh, give it a try. Let us know what you think. Um, but that's pretty much all we have for now. Um, Catherine, I guess I'll ask, do you have anything to add? <laughs> oh, and uh, today um, for our Expo Live, uh, we would love to be in person in Casper this year, but we just uh, couldn't do that. So we're going digital. Um, and so thank you for joining us and uh, helping us out here. Uh, next, our next event is next Thursday, same time. Uh, don't stop retrieving about training hunting dogs. Uh, we have a, a favorite uh, in-person uh, event with uh, Mark and Chelsea Spod and their dog. They have a uh, uh, Spinoni Italiano, two of them, uh, in the past few months, and then also an English Cocker Spaniel. Uh, and they have been to Expo in the past, and they will video uh, about training hunting dogs on uh, seven, uh, and then we'll also take questions. And, uh, uh, so the Full Blown Expo starts a week, a week from that. On May 6th, we'll be coming at you with three to four live events every day, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, uh, with a variety of topics. Uh, some of my favorites are um, a, a painting lesson uh, from the National Museum of Worldwide Art on painting pronghorn, and then there will also be our biologist Heather O'Brien, who leads our pronghorn working group. She will be there as well, so you can learn about uh, habitat and, uh, and species, pronghorn, uh, while you learn to paint them. So excited about that. That will be next Saturday, Saturday May 8th. Uh, also, for those of you that are hunters and would like some uh, tips on applying to help increase your success, I will have uh, Hunt Like a Pro application tips uh, will be on Saturday, Saturday morning at 9. So grab a cup of coffee and come join our licensing manager, uh, Lauren, uh, Sarah Dorenzo, our public information officer, and John Colossus, who helps with our uh, access uh, programs. So there's some great things coming up. You can see more at onexpo.com. Um, and you should uh, be sure to go there and register uh, for these events, even though you don't have to, you can see them. But we have this really quick cool that uh, we will send you to the mail, the real mail, uh, and uh, also some special uh, discounts from Honex. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Catherine, thanks for mentioning the discount from Onyx that uh, folks will have the opportunity to get by uh, registering for the event. And um, yeah, the sticker as well. And also, we are interested in knowing um, what you think of these events. So I have included a link to um, a survey in the chat. So uh, look through the comments for that. And please let us know what you think and uh, what you'd like to see in the future. Like Catherine said, this is an annual event, and although it's usually held in person um, most years, um, this is uh, our digital version of the event. And so we want to know uh, how we're doing and what maybe we should 
include once we get back to seeing you each in person. So uh, please fill out that survey. And with that, um, look for the events coming up. And Catherine, do you have anything to add to close it out? <laughs> No, thanks. My lights just turned off in my office. So uh, just thanks for being here, and we look forward to seeing you online uh, next week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.